Our moderator is Mandy McDonald, and she is the co-founder and managing director for Denny Naho. Uh, go ahead, Mandy. Thank you. Hello. Wache, Mandy McDonald, Natsi Katsun, Mandao Tsipi, Gotsi Nia, I am Mandy McDonald. I am originally from Churchill, Manitoba, and I grew up here in Samba K, Yellowknife. I'm the managing director for Dene Nowo, and I am uh, currently based in Edmonton for school right now. Um, I'm a first year student in the PhD program in Indigenous Studies. And I'm really excited to be here for this conference. It was such an inspiring day so far, and we have lots of more inspiration in store for you yet. It's the last panel of the day on cultural continuity. Uh, what's been clear so far today, though the gathering is on conservation, what's been made really clear by the presenters is the connection between Indigenous conservation, culture, and language. And I really want to thank all the presenters so far today that shared. I love hearing about um, the early days and the origin stories of programs getting off the ground. Uh, I love hearing about that kind of thing. So thanks, everyone. So the intention of this panel is uh, to provide inspiration and ideas for groups or nations who are starting to um, think about programming, whether it's starting new programs or developing programs that are already in place, or people who just want to network with other people delivering amazing programs. So I won't speak uh, really any more other than what I just said, and I'll introduce the panel. We've got uh, Chloe Dragon-Smith. She's going to go first, and I'll just say everyone's name quickly in the order that they're going to present. So Chloe's going first, then Frank, Kel then Kelsey, then Tony, and Mila's going last. And uh, I'll post some questions to the panel after they share a bit of info first, and I'll leave a bit of time at the end for any questions that are, that are out there. Okay. So uh, let's start with Chloe then. Let me pay up. Sit E, Chloe Dragon Smith, Hulier. Then, then, Yasti. Sit E, Ama Brenda Dragon, Hulier. Sit E, Aba Leonard Smith, Hulier. Aye, Sit E, Setsune Jane Dragon, Hulier. My name is Chloe Dragon Smith. I'm from Denende. I grew up in Yellowknife. My family's from Fort Smith. Um, my mom is Brenda Dragon, my father is Leonard Smith, and my grandmother is Jane Dragon. And uh, my mom's side is Dene Saint-Liné from um, originally Fond du Lac area, and we would move all the way up to the tundra as we did. And for all the other Dene Saint-Liné speakers here, um, my grandma tells me all the time that my pronunciation still isn't that good, so I already know. <laughs> um, so I chose, I choose to focus my time in on the land learning, I think because of something that Danica put really well this morning, um, which is that uh, for our indigenous systems to exist with integrity uh, within these conversations about conservation, um, we can't just be a data point or a line in a report about traditional knowledge. Our systems have to be integrated and that is about process. And that's how we do stuff every step of the way. Um, and for me, part of that process is on the land learning and it's a fundamental part. So I sat on the national advisory panel for the Pathway to Canada Target One and that was a really interesting experience for me. I went, I was nominated as a, a youth representative, and I got to the National Advisory Panel, which was a group working alongside the Indigenous Circle of Experts. And unlike the Indigenous Circle of Experts, we only had a, several um, Indigenous voices, and the rest uh, were Western conservationists and industry representatives. And so we were bringing together all of this, these wide um, variety of interests. And 
I was shocked in that process that a lot of the disagreements I en was ending up having was with the Western conservationists. And I started to realize that we can't just put, take indigenous conservation and thrust it into this Western paradigm of conservation and expect it to work easily. And so then I started thinking a lot about what indigenous conservation is for me and for my family and my community um, and the lands up here. Um, so bush kids, and you can see these pictures are rolling behind us. These are pictures of our time so far at Bush Kids. Um, it's a business that was co-founded by myself and another lady named Wendy Leahy about two years ago. We started in January, the deepest, darkest, coldest month in Yellowknife. And uh, Bush Kids is fundamentally established and governed in ethical space. So Wendy is a Western trained educator. She went to university to become a teacher and she has experience in Western models of outdoor education. Whereas I grew up on the land with my family learning from our indigenous learning principles. So the two of us came together and we decided that through our own uh, actions and decisions and the way we were gonna set up what we were gonna do, we were gonna try our very best to merge um, the Western system with the indigenous, with the, the, my Northern indigenous worldview. So Bush Kids also includes aspects of a movement called Forest and Nature School, which is about getting kids on the land to learn um, through inquiry and discovery and building relationships with land. Um, Forest and Nature School is said to have started in Denmark in the 50s. And so when I heard that, I was like, okay, we've been doing that for a really long time here and um, there's a lot we can, we can add to this model, although what existed there already fit really well with what I knew about my own um, indigenous learning principles. So we use that as a foundation as well. Our learning um, is first and foremost, though, led by the lands here, um, where we go out to practice and build relationship. We're working within the public education system uh, to bring ethical space specifically into um, that, that institution. And the reason we do that is because we believe that learning on the land is for everyone and that it has to be for everyone and um, connecting with nature should not be a privilege for some kids. Um, and so our goal is that on the land learning becomes part of everyday life and learning for um, as many people as we can, as many kids as we can within the NWT. Um, so just briefly, ethical space, like I said, is built into every decision that Wendy and I make together about how we run our business and how we uh, deliver our curriculum. But a few ways that we've found have worked for us are uh, we really focus, and I'm sure you can tell by these pictures, we really focus on food and food from the land and the learning that comes from that. We, the way we look at time is that the land leads our learning and our time. And so instead of having strict agendas to follow, um, we follow what the land is telling us. So sometimes, for instance, a tree will have fallen down and that will change our whole day because it's really fun and we want to be playing with a tree. Or the weather might be really windy in a spot that we had expected um, to be located and so we might move, things like that. Um, we, as much as we can, we try to be intergenerational and we bring in um, as many different sorts of people as we can to build community around Bush Kids because learning on the land, it's for the kids but it's also for us and it's for community and it's, um, you know, it's for me so I get to be outside as well um, learning my culture and eating traditional foods and not sitting behind a desk and it's for the elders that can come out and spend time on the land with us um, in, a, in an environment with kids and food and tea. And so uh, we work that in as much as we can. We also uh, look at other species. So we have dogs that come out with us and we spend a lot of time talking about 
our northern species and interacting with them as food and as hides and um, different things like that. Oop. And on that same vein, another one is family. So we invite the families of our students as much as possible to come and get involved in our learning. The biggest thing for me is that we base what we do on our relationships and on the land. And so uh, we will fall, if somebody comes in with a different plan than we had to begin with, we'll make the time and the space to follow that plan over what uh, we had originally set out to do. Um, so a program like Bush Kids, I think, would look really different everywhere that you go. Um, it's different based on lands, peoples, cultures, and knowledges, wherever you are, and I think that's the beauty of it. Um, but, I, but I do believe we can be doing it everywhere. And though we're really small, we have a small capacity right now, we're doing the best that we can to take opportunities to exchange knowledge with others. Um, and one exciting thing that we're doing is we're working with the early learning diploma students at Aurora College to, they're coming with us to our Bush Kids sessions and then Wendy and I are teaching a class, an additional class for them. Um, and these students are all, every single one of them is a young indigenous woman from a different community in the NWT. So they're taking these learnings and they're going back to all the communities that you guys come from with this knowledge and experience um, to be able to put uh, their own community lenses on this type of learning. Um, I believe that uh, on the land learning is absolutely central to Indigenous-led conservation. Um, it's, not, it's actually not separable from Indigenous conservation. And it's the same as guardians, um, which we heard about uh, before this. We may have to go through these different streams of funding and government departments to access these different facets that are important to us. But it's important, I think, to keep the big picture of who we are and why we are reconnecting with the land and how old and important these concepts are to us. Um, if we continue to hold that ourselves, and not get lost in all the, the different things that are going on in the different funding. I really think we can grow it and we can come together and I already see it happening with all the work that we're doing, which is fantastic. Everything that we do here is for future generations and I think that we all know that. We, we say it again and again, I hear it again and again. And the fact that it's four generations, I think, can lead us into thinking about on the land learning as a, as a foundation and a center of our discussions on IPCAs. It's, it's important that it's not an afterthought and it's not a working group and it's not a task force. On the land learning shouldn't be coming into our discussions after we've done the planning for our IPCAs and the politics and it's all over, but rather we can focus all that stuff on the foundation of why we're doing it. And for us, uh, our Indigenous learning principles are our Indigenous conservation principles. And they align, like when I read the ICE report and I think of what we're doing with Bush Kids, all the points of self-determination and land leading decision making, um, they fit exactly with what we're doing. and. Um, it's, again, it's for everybody. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now, but I just wanted to, I hope you guys enjoyed the pictures. I really enjoyed going through them because I've just been saving them and I haven't gone through them in a really long time. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it there for now. Tahuna, thank you very much. So we're going to let all the presenters speak and then we'll ask questions at the end. So if you have a question for Chloe, you can just write it down. Don't forget it. We'll come back to it in a bit. 
so the next presenter, Frank Brown, uh, we have a short vignette to share first. Do you want to say anything about it before we start? Okay. Okay, we're going to need some sound uh, just so you know. Hopefully it works. Maybe I'll just start it again to get the sound. Can you turn the sound up a bit, please? Oh, is he there? It's as high as it'll go. It's not coming out of here, it's coming out of the phone. Can you make it any louder? I can start it again. Oh. Anyone in the region. I'm just going to start it again. It was just 30 seconds, so we'll go from there. One of the key vessels that began the empowerment Perfect. and the resurgence of language and culture has been the ocean going canoe. It brings you back to, you know, this is our way of life, this is who I am. And that started for us when we organized and carved the canoe and then paddled to Vancouver for Expo 86. I don't think way back in 1986 anyone envisioned that it would be such a huge part of the revitalization of, of the culture. It really opened everybody's eyes up and down the coast that, you know, we have a history here, you know. I think that it has given meaning to our history, to our children, that my generation never got. It's a dream come true, and now I believe the whole coast is alive with their connection to the past. Currently our community is preparing to paddle down to the Nisqually tribe. It's a lot of healing for me, like, makes you find yourself again, because people lose themselves, like, a lot. Travel journeys is the most wonderful thing, having that a part of the young people's lives will make a great difference. It's amazing to see the youth identify with the, yeah, milk and the pride that comes along with it. It can change the future of our First Nations people forever. So um, I'm going to move over here because I want to share this um, paper we wrote uh, 11 years ago now. And uh, okay. it was the international year of biodiversity. I was thinking about what could I say in a continuity, uh, cultural continuity panel. And uh, I've been involved in the canoe resurgence pretty well my whole adult life. When I was uh, actually a student studying outdoor recreation management, um, I, the mayor of Vancouver wrote a letter. I was working at the Native Friendship Center and said, we want participation in uh, uh, Expo 86. And I thought we should carve a canoe and paddle down a coast. And we did that. And um, it, this was like a, a tinder box. It just went up like that. And we 86, there was one canoe. and. Now in uh, tribal canoe journeys, there's a hundred and a uh, thousand native paddlers and 20,000 natives. And it's sometimes referred to as the most significant uh, event in uh, Indian country today because there's nowhere else where our people are gathering in such large numbers uh, and self-organizing. And really, it's about that connection to nature and that uh, the continuity of that. You know, it's... Um, you know, this is just the, the latest iteration of uh, our relationship to place. Um, <clears throat> I think that the work that we're doing with guardians, I, I refer to it as the creator's work. I'm really happy to see everybody here, you know, because we're looking after the land, we're upholding our laws and our teachings, and we're looking after our, our um, future generations. You know, in the, uh, the Chilquitin decision, it talked about the 
communal nature of Aboriginal rights and also being for future generations. And that is very much uh, the, in the spirit of our worldview. And um, <clears throat> honestly, I, I, I used to be involved with the rediscovery programs, doing youth programming, bringing kids out on the land, but I kind of burnt out. My wife and I, we kind of burnt out. It was a lot of work. Spend 90% uh, of our time trying to raise money. And 10% uh, of the time actually bringing kids out. And then that's when we moved into the ecotourism work. Uh, we own an ecotourism business. We trained, along with guardians, uh, over 60, just about 70 uh, uh, tourism guides with uh, 37 transferable credits toward a tourism undergrad because, you know, I always felt like we we're going to be dependent. We needed to have a way of being independent, self-sufficient, uh, as our ancestors were, and this is uh, sort of the latest iteration of building what uh, we call a conservation economy. So this paper that um, we did is called Staying a Course, Staying Alive. It was during the International Year of Biodiversity. And uh, there was this lady, her name is Ethel Blondin Cranmer, and she uh, recently won that, uh, I used to call it the National Aboriginal Achievement Award, but uh, in Indian Indigenia or something like that, no? Uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> she gave it this title, because I was an advisor to Biodiversity BC, and um, uh, I, I sat there and I was in a room full of 50 scientists, and, I, and I, it, it just didn't sit right with me, and I said, in all due respect, this doesn't reflect uh, indigenous world view. Uh, we don't have a word for biodiversity. Um, and uh, we have been in our place for a long time and they were really challenged with um, even communicating to the general public because even the general public doesn't, at that time, 11 years ago, didn't even know what biodiversity conservation meant. It was a bunch of scientists trying to figure out how they're going to engage with the public around these critical issues affecting humanity because they knew that we were in crises even then. It was uh, predictable based on the modeling. Anyway, this woman, uh, she, uh, I said to her, you know, we're de I'm sitting in a room full of scientists and how, are, how am I going to um, sort of engage with them? And she said, you know what, we didn't create this mess but we have to live with it. And so what we have to do is we have to stay the course in order to stay alive. And that's a part of the continuity conversation that we're having here on this panel. Um, it's fundamental truths around biodiversity, stewardship, and sustainability. That's now 11 years later. Uh, there's uh, public policy around the world driving this. Uh, this because of the climate change issue and, and what we're doing in, in indigenous-led conservation work, but based on our teachings, because of our place-based teachings, I think that's really a critical part of the work. Um, this, by the way, this is all open sourced, and so that uh, you can access this. And uh, Ethel and myself, we talked, uh, talked about this, about taking this, um, this teachings and then uh, sharing it in other regions because we were so limited with our resources we're saying well it isn't like we had I had three women that were my advisors one Haida lady a Namgis and a Hiltzuk woman and I asked them are there core values or fundamental truths about biodiversity sustainability and stewardship and they said well of course silly and so over many cups of tea we came up with those core values or truths and uh, so we don't have time, this is like 106 pages long. It's open sourced, it's available to you to use as a resource. And uh, it's on biodiversitybc.org. I think that there's some transferable lessons. We always thought it would be a good idea to share it with other people that um, have, have the similar values, uh, indigenous place-based people. Like for us, we've got um, our seven, we came up with seven truths, the creation, our connection to nature, um, respect, knowledge, stewardship, sharing, and adapting to change. And then what we did was we used um, stories, language, maps, and practices here, down here to validate our truths. 
And we all have stories, and we all have our own language, and we all have our own practices, and maps is an, a placeholder for technology, and those what uh, basically equate to our, our truths. You know, as an example, respect, we all have equal value, life has equal value. We acknowledge and respect that the, the plants and animals have a life force, and that's why we respect them, because they sustained us. And so I think society is at a very much of a crossroads right now because colonial values has been about extraction. And they thought that things would go on forever. And, and the indigenous place-based values have been why we've continued to exist in our place through the millennia is because there was laws and systems of governance that sustained us. And so um, I'm just saying that this is available as a framework. I think that this could help to create structure and process. Um, it was peer-reviewed by, by those knowledge keepers. And it's really about the, the, uh, the continuity of our, our teachings on the, the land and the, and the water. Uh, this is the region that we come from on the uh, Pacific Northwest Coast. And uh, so as, as an example, though this, this beautiful lady, Gloria Webster Cranmer, I mentioned her because it was her father who was put into prison because he was hosting a potlatch, which was our system of governance on the coast, and uh, she had a burn. She was pissed right off, righteously pissed off, and she was the first Native graduate from UBC. She got, uh, got a, her degree there and in, uh, in anthropology, I believe. They said, the only way you'll be able to take the artifacts that we seized from you from the ceremony is if you build a museum. And she did. And, and so this woman was an, an amazing knowledge keeper. And um, <clears throat> so we all have our creation stories, our ancestral teachings. This is an example. And what we did was we used for those uh, three women, we, we, I asked them for the different creation stories from the different territories. And in that way, it's kind of like a peer review. You know, these, it's pretty interesting watching those uh, elders, um, how they rolled and uh, kind of figured stuff out to kind of um, cross-reference each other's intellectual property and process and stories. We say the Nuyum, the stories are, uh, are the... Um, they're owned by the, the leaders of our, our region. So this is an example, um, connection to nature, the teachings that we have, like our stories and our lines of inheritance can be traced right back to our first generation stories where the creator put our, our first ancestors down. Um, and it goes on. But I think that probably would be adequate. I, I think maybe what I should do right now is just stop and uh, hand it over, but it's, uh, maybe we can post it or share this information to you so that um, if you want it as a resource, then please, by all means, it's open source. That was the agreement with those knowledge keepers to share that information because that is a part of our teachings to be able to share. And then maybe Ethel and I and others will work on advancing something for the rest of the country. So Wallace Gyasica, Wait. Wow, thank you. Okay, so we'll uh, hear from Kelsey next. Oh, there's a clicker. There's a clicker. You can travel or you can just use that. Masi <laughs> Cho um, for inviting me to speak. Uh, my name is Kelsey Wrightson. I work at Dishinta Center for Research and Learning. Um, I'm from Muskogee, Wisconsin, um, Treaty Six, now known as Edmonton. Um, and I am very grateful to be here on the territory of the Yellowknife Standing First Nation. 
I'm sorry that I missed this morning, um, but uh, I've already spent a lot of time listening, um, and I'm just so excited to be in this room with everyone, um, and I acknowledge all the work that the organizers put um, in order to get us all together in the same space. Um, I also want to say that there's a lot of expertise in this room and on this panel, um, and a lot of people who've also spent a lot of time working with Dushinta. Um, I'm really happy to see some of the elders that I got to spend some time with this summer. Um, so there's hopefully going to be lots of time for questions, and maybe they'll pop in as well. Um, but really what I want to do is just kind of give an overview of Dishinta, what our goals are. We've been operating for 10 years, um, but there's been some changes in the last two years that are really exciting and we'd like to, to share those. Um, so Dishinta Center for Research and Learning is a land-based post-secondary program. Um, that is a blank page. There we go. Uh, so we aim to create a family inclusive community of learning. Um, so all our programs are multi-generational and we really embrace um, and you'll see some of the kids from Dushinta or actually some of the kids from Bush Kids. I saw that. <laughs> um, so we're really working towards building um, a whole community of learners together. Um, we, the core of our programming is delivered with um, elders and faculty members that are from the community. Um, so we always work in consultation with our community partners and we're really working to celebrate the brilliance of the communities that we're operating in. So what that looks like um, is that we move our accreditation to different lands and territories. So through a partnership with the University of British Columbia and the University of Alberta, all of the courses that we deliver are accredited and transferable across institutions through the Western Dean's Agreement. So it really is an opportunity for students to take courses that reflect their communities, reflect the knowledge of their lands and territories, and are um, designed and delivered to allow them to take post-secondary education education in a space that's close to home um, and that's inclusive of their whole families. Um, so we've done programming in the Satu, we've done programming on the Peel River, um, and we've done programming in the Daicho, um, and we're actually very excited to announce that we'll be doing some more programming there this summer. Um, so through the University of British Columbia, um, it's taken four years, but Dishinta has developed something that's called the Dishinta Certificate in Land and Community-Based Research. And what this is, is a five-course terminus certificate that students can take in one block of intensive study, or they can take it in multiple courses over the duration of a few years. So this is really exciting because um, all of the courses are 50% uh, evaluated by their land-based programming and 50% evaluated based on academic um, teaching and the uh, knowledge that the professors bring. But what this does is it really um, centers the knowledge that comes from the community, it centers the knowledge that comes from community leadership and elders, and it centers the knowledge that comes from the land. So a lot of our professors, when they articulate their roles, it's less about bringing in knowledge from outside and about facilitating the students to learn from those around them, from the community around them. So I think one of the really innovative and important things about this is because all of the work is 100% land-based, it actually serves to challenge the dichotomy that sometimes happens between what academic knowledge is and what land-based education is. And really what it's doing is bringing those two together and saying there's no difference between land-based education, the things that you're learning from culture and traditions, the things that you're learning from these practices, and governance and law and politics. All of those things are brought together and through practice, that's how you start to learn and that's how you start to learn in community. Um, so we have done a number of different programs and a number of different courses. We operate in all seasons. Um, and we have been doing the bulk of our programming in, um, in relation with the Yellow Knives Dene First Nation. Uh, so two years ago they identified a spot for us called Mackenzie Island, um, which is about a 15 minute boat ride just south of Detta. Um, and students spend between 
four and six weeks on the land on this island learning from the community. We are constantly very grateful for all the visitors that come by and share stories and knowledge and quite often meat. There's caribou and dry fish. And those six weeks of land-based programming is the core of what the certificate is and what they take away. Uh, so I think that I will probably leave it there um, and make sure that there's lots of time for questions. Um, but we're really excited about the opportunities to partner with new communities and move across uh, the whole north. Um, like I said, the really innovative thing about the, the certificate that's been developed through UBC is that um, the accreditation moves so it can go to different communities and different territories. Masicho. Thank you, Kelsey. Very informative. <laughs> and uh, now we will hear from Tony Rebesca. Do you want to say something? Oh, you don't have a video. Okay. Oh, you this. Masi, so not this in Masi, so the Tony Rabbit's Cassio, the Yabsi Consati, so not this in Masi. Just like to say thank you for coming and being part. Uh, one of my work as a cultural practice manager with the Tinsun government, when I first got hired, uh, they first told me you got to be creative. <laughs> so, and um, one of the things that uh, I learned from the elders, uh, because I was raised by my grandfather, um, he said, you, uh, you got to be strong like two in order to survive in the society today. I have to learn the traditional knowledge and skills required to live on the land, but at the same time, able to put the computer together. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, one of the things that I was taught, uh, I was very, uh, the elders uh, sat them with them, they said that the traditional knowledge and way of life is very heavy, it's very powerful, and people's life is in our hands. That's one of the things that they always taught me. And today, when we talk about cultural language and way of life, it is very heavy. Our young people are lost. Next generation, we need to plan. And how can I hold another person's hand to develop a path that they themselves will be understanding based on strongly too? So one of the things that I'm going to be showing today is to have a, to begin with the. The, the learn the things that I've, I have to search for myself inside was to also search myself to learn about my culture and how my culture start the healing. The healing com component, component comes from uh, the clinical they themselves heal themselves but at the same time work with others to heal others and work together. So one of the things that I've learned when I had a meeting with the elders, they said, well, let's do something about Ezra making peace. They're the ones that make a difference. They're the ones that we could start using their knowledge and to start beginning the foundation of healing. So I'm gonna just I'm gonna share some. So one of the things that I'm gonna be sharing is some of the stuff, but I'll just be go forward as uh, Bellows. One of the things that uh, is very important that the oral history is kept alive. One, and then uh, looking at today, we still continue the, the, the cultural and the way of life with the elders. There's a lot of meaning behind this story. And there's a lot of prophets and a lot of elders. And today, we were, most of the elders are not with us today. Most of, most of them are gone. So the purpose of the Edzo making peace was to uh, translate into a, a moving picture. We want to make it into a moving picture. And we want to see other people looking at it and making sure that 
what they see, how our, our leaders in the past made peace among each other. They work together. Today, we need to continue on working together. That's what, the, that's what it's all about. As Aboriginal, it's all about working together, peace, and helping each other. One of the things about uh, Kuzunkati, that's where I brought the elders there, and the elders would say, it's a land of forgiveness. The land, the land that, uh, that, we, that Kuzunkati is Mesa Lake, where we, we took the elders and they did a lot of sharing stories. Yeah, it's a, it's the, they call it the land of forgiveness. And one of the things that uh, happened back then, it was uh, we took the elders back to the land where the peace was made between Edzo and Keicho. And uh, when, we, when we set up the tents and everything, there was a lot of emotional. And the area was very, very, uh, one of the things that they seen was the rock where Edzo uh, had his son head behind it and, and then when Akechu was coming. So all these things that was coming, that's, uh, what, there's a lot of uh, story behind it. There's a lot of uh, history. I guess the vision is to start looking at recon healing and reconcili reconciliation based on Edzon making peace, important of reviving the peace and healing, and, and incorporating stories, legend into the school curriculum. One, that's one, one of the things that we wanted to do was to teach our next generation of what our people did in the past and the, the healing that they themselves, even though they didn't speak English, but they still knew what to do to make peace within themselves. I think one of the things that I'm looking at is clinical government also to practice uh, support. I think they really supported this animation because the vision that was there at the beginning when Edzo and Akechu made peace back in 1800s was very important. Just the peace without the peace, we're not going to be here today. The elders said that. They've been fighting, fighting, and over many years, and finally, the two leaders make peace. And today, we have a self-government. Today, you have Treaty 8. Today, we're sitting here. The elders said, thank you, God. That's what the Edzo and Akechu did for us. And that's, that's one of the things that I want to look back and, and look at all these years that we, I, I started back in 2004. And these are all the workshops we did with the elders and youth. We even had, we even had an acting training. Dakota House came to do acting training and got acting. Then we recruited around 10 actors, and they were doing the screening, and they were acting. And yeah, it was a whole bunch of work done just to make this little short movie. But it was very important that the elders wanted to see that happen. Some of the elders here are with us that were taking part. The youth, this is at the school at Chief Jim Bruno. And most of the elders there, only one elders is with us right now. It's, all of them are gone in just four years. This is a workshop we did on the land. We brought youth on the land and, and uh, storytelling. And John B. came there to also help and, sh and support us. We also did a workshop at a school where uh, we did some filming and also did some, yeah, on the land programs and uh, even acting. They were doing, the sh we were doing screening. This is where a kid show sat behind. This is the rock that we're talking about. It's a very special rock. That's only rock that's sitting on that on on Mesa Lake. That's where Edzo Edzo's son hid behind. There's a story behind there. So when we when we got to Mesa Lake, Kusunkati, elders did the prayers, and there's a, even though and they did the you know feeding the fire ceremonies, and then we did we did another land program, a different program, but uh, and then we did the art program 
with the youth local artists like Archie Bolio, who's not with us no more. And uh, now we have like James uh, Woodson. All of them were taking part in the, in the program. And they were teaching the next generation. And there's one the land program. There's where Dakota came in and did the acting training. And, uh, and uh, yes, these are the young people that uh, took part in the acting training program. And then here we did the actual screening. And, and for me, I didn't know how to do it. I said, I need help. And these young women said, I, I could make all these crops and clothes and everything. They put everything together. It was, a, <laughs> it was a whole community just putting together, just want to help out. And young people too. So we dressed them up and then we started doing acting and act, then and stop. It was like something new for us. And then we did a workshop again to design with the, with the artists to give us a little bit of a feedback on what we needed more pictures. And then we did a sound narrative workshop. We had uh, people that did that in, in Klinchu and also in English. So, and then the UFA, we went down to UFA Alberta at the university and we took some course there and uh, took some training with the artists. We took artists to actually to the art area and uh, did the, so it was really good to just take part in the UFA. One of the things that, that things behind is the healing journey. We needed, we needed to understand the healing journey and the five steps of healing. And one of the things that we found out was that all these things that was part of what Ed's on the Kitchen were doing is making that peace. It's a foundation of healing. And finding out that fe the healing also comes from the spiritual. It's a, the spiritual is part of the foundation of healing. So feeding the fire and all, and all that. But uh, one of the things that also, the, we went to the grave site and yeah, it was, it was just amazing. It's just amazing. So building our, building our nation, we need to start educating our next generation our language, cultural. Without that, right now, young people will be lost. That's why today I tell young people, whoever speaks clean tune right now, in next 30 to 50 years, there will be the important resource people standing up right here on this. I said, I said if you speak the clean tune in 30 to 50 years, you'll be standing up right now. That's how important the language is. I think uh, more awareness, healing, and then we started looking at how to put an action plan. And one of the things that I wanted to present to the Clinton government is to make sure that we have a plan in place. Because we have to walk and talk. We just, sometimes I found I find that for me to work in this area, it's hard to let the government understand that healing is part of our culture, of who we are. But when we go out on the land, it's a natural healing. Everything comes natural. You feel good. That's part of it. That's part of who we are. And here, we're just looking at the, when you start the, to make change in your life, that you contribute your spiritual and emotional well-being. Your mind, soul, and body will change. It, it'll change. I'm just looking at the middle person. That's a middle person that went to Kudluktuk back in uh, 2008 when they were traveling on the, on the Skidoo. And, and I think it took them like six days. This young guy just was sitting on the rock. I think he was just praying. Hopefully he survived. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and then they just took a picture of him. Boy, that guy was just praying. Uh, uh, and he made it. Yeah. So I'd just like to say Masi Cho and uh, thank you for uh, listening and, and hopefully uh, I'm going to hopefully watch the video tomorrow. This is a, if, you can, if they're going to put a video on tomorrow lunch, this is the second time I'm going to show it. The animation is completed, so I just wanted to say Masi, thank you.
I'm looking forward to watching that tomorrow, Tony. Thank you for that. And now we'll hear from Mila. Hello, I don't have a presentation, I just want to stand over here. Uh, my name is Mila Nakeko, I'm Dene from the Det Cho and Dene Suthlene. My dad is Jim Antoine and my mom is Celine Antoine. I am a moose hide tanner, a mom, and a founding member of Dene Nawo. I am going to talk about um, one, of, one of the streams of programming that we do with Dene Nawo is um, our high tanning initiatives. It's um, one of uh, my favorite things to talk about. I personally, I started uh, my high tanning journey about 12 years ago, and uh, I've worked with many elders from um, communities across Den and Day uh, to uh, reclaim uh, this land-based knowledge. Um, today, I. I consider myself a land-based indigenous arts educator. I've worked in uh, many communities in the Northwest Territories and across Canada helping communities reclaim this knowledge. And uh, for Dene Nawo, um, we have two high tanning um, programs. One is our urban high tanning camp, which uh, a lot of you in Yellowknife may have uh, come and visit. We are down um, by City Hall. Uh, we, it's usually two weeks. Uh, this year we're gonna have it in the first two weeks of May. And um, everybody's welcome to come down, have some tea, and come check out uh, the high tanning uh, camp that, we're, that we set up. The other um, program that we have is our high tanning mentorship program, and uh, we've delivered this program in Banff, Wati, and we've also partnered with Nunatsiavit in Nain Labrador. Um, that was uh, more of the climate change uh, indigenous solutions uh, programming. They have, because of climate change, uh, their experience, their their. Um, uh, have moose in their territory for the first time ever in history. And so we, we went and traveled there uh, with some uh, knowledge holders from uh, Sutsoke, myself, and our, um, uh, and our, and our young uh, employee from at Deninawo, Danya, and uh, worked, with, uh, worked with, uh, with the community of Nain. It was really incredible. So um, I wish I, I should have had photos. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, oops, sorry, I have notes all over the place. I mean, kind of have, um, So why is our high tanning initiatives important for Dene Nawo? Um, high tanning provides a framework uh, of protocol and behavior that works in um, that works in all aspects of our life. It uh, it. Um, it teaches us discipline and respect, and it's a way uh, for us to create safe indigenous spaces to connect to those things that make us uh, Dene uh, or indigenous. Um, uh, and um, yeah, for the, the role of culture, uh, for myself, like when I teach high tanning, um, when I bring the, this work to other communities, uh, I always base um, a lot of my teachings on our Dene laws. And one of those Dene laws is uh, to be happy. And it seems like a really simple concept to have, but um, part of that is um, being conscious and um, being conscious of your thoughts and the energy that you have while you're working. And it really helps to um, tie together like the whole, our whole community, our harvesters, um, our high tanners, our elders, and also our relationship with the animals that we hunt and harvest. And so I always think, th I always um, teach that. And so um, a part of the high tanning initiatives um, from the work that we've been doing for the past few years, uh, Denny Nawo has been offering support to other communities uh, to support um, in their fundraising efforts for communities to run their own um, high tanning and also the way that we structure our camps that we provide support in, um, in, in that as well. Um, 
advising around organizing, and also to teach when we're invited to other communities. Uh, Mandy and I have uh, taught in uh, Tegwa, Tagamo, Cree Nation in Northern Ontario. I was just recently uh, at the First Williams First Nation outside of Thunder Bay uh, two weeks ago, which um, that community just ran their first ever land-based camp, which was high tanning. So I was there supporting the community. It was um, it was it was quite beautiful. The amount of people that came out, and um, they're they're going to continue working. Um, on hides in the fall, and so in a lot of the communities that we've worked in, they've they're um, continuing to 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 do the camps, and and um, also we're building the capacity of high tanners in other nations like Anishinaabe. I've worked with a few Anishinaabe communities, and so the students that we've had are now running their own camps and teaching at their own tanning camps. And um, I'm continuing to work with the Mi'kmaq in um, New Brunswick as well, and hopefully um, they'll also be um, delivering their own high camps without, without our, with, with our support from afar. And um, it's, uh, so yeah, high tanning has been um, a really important part of my life personally, and it's also been, um, I think that it's been really important for our communities as a whole as well, and supporting uh, indigenous artists is one of the is one of the uh, things that we talk about too. Is just like how um, how important uh, our traditional practices are for our traditional economy. Um, high tanning it's a it's a lot of work, um, and all of our and all of the art and the work that we do, we should be getting um, paid for that amount of work so that we're able to sustain ourselves and our communities and our sm smaller communities and stuff. And so it's been um, really educational for uh, people that are coming through our high tan urban high tanning camps to just see the amount of work that goes into it and really appreciate um, the, the, um, the art and the crafts that they, have, that, that they buy afterwards and just be like, just kind of understand why things are and um, so in um, elevating uh, the art, indigenous arts in the north and in, in indigenous communities, uh, supporting communities, we also like support artists. Um, I, and also um, just on conservation and our protected land areas. I always believe um, myself as a high tanner that I use my traditional territory. I go out onto my land and I, um, harvest the wood and the poles. Um, my, my parents, my family hunt. My dad just got a moose last night. And uh, so I have a new hide that I have to start working on soon. And um, so just by, just by practicing our, in our culture and um, being involved in our communities, we are using the land just naturally because we need the land to do this work. And so in that way, we are asserting our indigenous rights in that, in that way we're protecting, we're protecting those areas because we're using them. And um, also, uh, I, I, was, I was really listening because I was listening intently, so I'm kind of a little scatterbrained because I have like so much information from recording. Uh, when Danica was saying earlier that there was a couple of other people that were talking about um, combining indigenous knowledge systems with the best of the Western, Western scientists, um, I always, like, because I've been doing this work and I've been doing this land work like across Canada and, um, and working very closely with animals and their skin that I've seen, I see the effects of climate change on our animals directly. There's um, parasites, there's ticks, there's other types of um, skin anom anomalies. <laughs> Um, and and such that that are that are happening and, and some of it is quite alarming. Um, so uh, for myself and for other people that are land, like land users and we're on the land and doing this type of work, science is observation. And so like I really thought that when Danica was talking about that, I'm just like we're so closely we're so close to the land that this is. This is also like the information that we have because we observe and we record the stuff. We talk about this with our elders. Have you seen this before? And it's like, no, or is this, or is this further down south? And yeah, so there's knowledge exchange that happens in our communities naturally that are um, like scientific. Um, 
And yeah, there's, I can talk about moose high tanning for days. And uh, I think, but um, thank you so much. And I really do hope that a lot of you come through to our urban high tanning camp in the first two weeks of Maine at City Hall. So, messy. Masi Cho Mila, sounds like an amazing, amazing program. I work there too, by the way. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all so much for sharing. What really came across to me when I was listening to you talk um, collectively, like the role of the idea of indigenous-led conservation being for everyone in the sense that we're, cons we're trying to conserve the land for everyone, not just ourselves and not, not just our nations, but the role of indigenous conservation globally and particularly in North America and the leadership that indigenous communities are doing in the service of um, the entire planet, really. That came across, especially uh, in Chloe's presentation. And so amazing that uh, taking the initiative to educate the, the youngest people in our community on the land is really cool. And that also goes with the Chinta's programming because they also have children's programming during the semesters. I know that because I used to work there too. I don't know if Kelsey touched on that, but it's true. Um, and then also extremely important, the role of art and creativity, not only for indigenous self-determination, but indigenous-led indigenous conservation and film, art, high tanning as a, as a tool for conservation as well. I think we got a really interesting sort of cross-section of different programs that people are doing, and it's really cool. Uh, so we don't have a ton of time left, and I have a list of questions, but are there any questions from the audience here? Here comes the mic. Hi, my name is Prairie. I'm from Klutsoge. Um I just I have a couple questions and just a couple comments. Uh, listening to you guys' presentations, I hear you, I feel you, because that's how we live every day. Um, you know, people know where they come from and who they are. They know what their land is. They know what kind of animals are there. They know how to use their TK knowledge and stuff. Um, I just got a, um, with the high tanning, I know um, this started in Flutsoge years and years ago. And then that happened, it was just like a little camp. And then it got bigger and bigger. And then um, like people started coming, it's getting bigger and bigger. Um, if you read on my bio here in the paper, my grandmother is uh, Madeline Catholic. She's the oldest elder in Flutsoge. She's the monarch of our family. She is, uh, she just turned 91, um, and we had a birthday for her. But she's, she's old, but she still practices. She's the one that carried that hide tanning tradition in our family. So most of our grandchildren now, like we all, we're back into hide tanning and stuff like that. Um, it's for me, you know, you're learning on the land, but for me, in my experience, and the land is who you are, you know it. When, since you're born, and if you're, if you're raised or you live in a traditional isolated community, that's what, you've, what you learn from the day you, you were born. And then you carry that and carry that and you pass it on. Um, I really like the programs that you guys have. Sounds really good, nice. Uh, we have, as I was saying, we have the big high tanning camp. Um, I just wanted to know, um, where's this Bush Kids camp? Where's that located? So uh, we're based in Yellowknife right now and uh, yeah, I was realizing after, I was like, I don't think I even said where I was doing that. So it's, yeah, it's in Yellowknife. And we, so we run a private program on every Tuesday, uh, so once a week, and parents register their kids, and they come, they come to our site. Uh, they're out of school 
for um, for the Tuesdays and that program is kind of where we do it's like our little um, guinea pig area where we try all sorts of stuff and experiment and then what we do um, is we take our learnings to the public system by mentoring teachers at different schools around Yellowknife um, and they uh, we work with each teacher and their class for at least six weeks and then the hope is that they will continue um, to bring learning to their classroom and we can expand that way and yeah like I said right now we're we're just in Yellowknife but we are training like I said um, Aurora College students that are from all different communities across the north and so hopefully that's a way that we can start moving to different communities. Thanks. Thank you. Are there, does someone else have a different question? Hi, I was, oh, I was just wondering um, if there were any tools in your guys' experience to really um, help people become engaged and get excited about the type of work that you do. Yeah, you know, all the work that we're doing, um, <clears throat> if our young people, if our children aren't uh, active, then, you know, why? Right? So I, I can appreciate the question, and I think it, it really is um, the responsibility rests with us to do the work and to create the structures and the processes and uh, kids are amazing, you know, they'll just gravitate when you create that for them to, to do that. And then the other part of it too is um, when communities, children and youth and elders are involved and then those resources become threatened, those are the communities that will stand up because they're in relationship to the land and the water and they depend on the land and the water. But if they're not in relationship to those resources, then it, it, it'll, it won't matter to them. And, and that's uh, why this is so important. Um, because we aren't who our ancestors were. You know, we are modernized. And so we have to use the best tools available to us um, both uh, through our traditional teachings and the best of what Western science has to offer in these different uh, methods and uh, delivery processes. So it's kind of a fusion of that. And I guess my closing comment around that is <clears throat> even though we have been through so much as uh, Indigenous place-based people, um, the resiliency that has been shown through time, through the dark times of colonization is, uh, it's amazing. And uh, I want to say this as a way of encouraging us that um, we as the living descendants have the moral authority to make those decisions. Not other governments, not anthropologists, not archaeologists, not policy advisors, not consultants, but us. When we come together with our leadership, our elders and our chiefs and the people that uh, in, within according to our own governance structures and processes, and we make a decision that we're going to support programs like these, then that's what we do. And we, go, we move forward in a good way, as our ancestors did. It's a continuation, and that's been the theme of this yeah. panel. Is the, and, and so it's the adaptation and the adoption according to who we are, where we are in our time and place to fulfill our responsibility and duty for the future generations. Uh, it's a good question because... Um, for me, in order to deliver a hand game tournament, and I have to understand the game, so I have to put a, a plan together that's based on our 
the game and the law and the traditional law of the game. But the only way to get the support will be with the elders. I can't just pass on something that's, that's very sacred. But when I said, let's start a hanging tournament in Bishop Kung back in uh, 2005, I met with the elders three days until finally three days they said yes. And the only reason they say was, let's play it simple, not too complicated. And I think that's when the rules put together, everything started putting plan together, and that's when we had a tournament back in Bishop But the main thing is, it's not finished. It's continuity, what he's saying. Uh, one thing about it when, when we did was, uh, the elder said, well, let's have a workshop because what's the traditional law of the game? Do you know the tra traditional law and the protocol? And that's when we said, well, let's put something together. And, and we need to have these things in place. We can't just deliver a program, but there has to be a protocol, something behind there that will make sure it will be kept. Not only that, but it has to also be values and belief of the culture and way of life. Masi. Hello. Um, engaging youth and children in the work. Uh, there's... Um, a lot of the high camps that we have, I know the high camp, it's okay, is family friendly. Our kids all gang up and run on through the woods and stuff like that. So um, also, uh, so in, in those aspects, when like high camps are held in communities, they're family inclusive and so it becomes normalized to be around this hard work and stuff. Also, uh, one of, just an example for one of our high camps is that um, we, uh, work with all of the schools in town. And so that we'll have uh, school tours like throughout campus running. And so I think I've seen almost every single child that's in elementary school in Yellowknife. And I've made half of them hold a brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, it comes back to what it all keeps coming back to for me is the land and getting people on the land because we can talk about it and talk about it and talk about it, and I do, but we, you know, you just have to get people out on the land, feed them, be together, and then they understand the magic or are reminded of because they know it somewhere within themselves and um, are living lives that don't allow them to see it on a regular basis. So it's for us, it just be it became making the spaces and getting people out. And it's not perfect, and we don't always know what it's going to look like or how it's going to come together. But we have access to um, a huge, you know, spiritual and emotional and all of the things that are important to us, a backing. And it's the land, and it's all around us, and it's around our communities, even in Yellowknife, um, which arguably has uh, the least uh, us to land within the community, we're able to get people out and have our discussions um, and our learning on the land. So I'd say bring it back to the land. Um, and I just want to add one thing to that is um, learn how to listen. Um, I think the, the greatest measure of success of a program was when we listened to the elders about the space that we were holding it. Um, and then at the end of the program, they informed me that they weren't going home. And I was like, great, that is the measure of success. Um, so if you learn how to listen, you can figure out how to reduce the barriers that you know about and can see, reduce the barriers that you can't see, um, and really make sure that you're, you're serving the community. I'll add something too. So, um, for uh, I'll speak to a little bit more to the high turning programs at Denny No Whoa. So I think that what I hear a lot of people talking about today with their on the land programs, the Guardian programs, and everything that the panelists said is that. The programs are not just teaching conservation skills, they're not just teaching about the land, they're facilitating opportunities for indigenous people to really build and develop a really strong relationship to the land. And that relationship is what informs 
um, initiative and values around conservation. That's what makes people want to really protect what they have and what they have a relationship to. And so for us at Dene No Wo, with the hide tanning, one of the reasons that we do the hide tanning programs, and I'll say that Mila is already pretty much booked spring through fall with hide tanning camps across the country. Uh, we started delivering hide tanning programs because we love hide tanning. It is so fun and you get to spend time with people and community on the land, working on hides and laughing, eating good food and building relationships, not just with each other and the land, but the animals and the water and the air and everything. And a lot of indigenous people, uh, especially in urban contexts, really want that right now. And so we hardly have to promote the programs at all. There's always tons of people writing, emailing, how they can participate and how we can support them to deliver programs in their community. So it's not, we don't try to get people out. They just want to come and have a good time with us, Tanning Heights. And so I think if you are kind of like working from a place of love and really trying to uh, do something that you love to do and you work from a place of joy as well, then people are going to just flock to it. Yeah. Any other questions? Bobby Rose, do you have your hand up over there? <laughs> oh well, thanks. I didn't plant that. <laughs> um, so we have a couple minutes left, and one of the questions I had for the presenters is about lessons learned. So, you know, you have a vision, try to carry it through to implementation. Uh, are there any stories that you could share with us about lessons you learned along the way that maybe we can learn from here? Hello, hello. Um, yeah, I had no idea that I, my job would be moose high tanning with graphic recording on the side. <laughs> But when I started um, high tanning, it was, um, I'm a single mom, and so I came back to the north and I wanted to provide for my kids, and so I was sewing and I ran out of moose hide. And so I was like, I'm just gonna tan my own moose hide. And that was like 12 years ago. <laughs> so like, the first couple of hides, I didn't sell anything, I just gave them to elders. And so like, from where I started to wanting to do something for myself to, um, um, trying to trying to sustain stay my kids as an artist um, as as a single mother like 12 years ago uh, and and to to have it like build and 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 working with other my peers and building a high tanning family and then an organization and then just like the past two years um, how many communities are looking and searching for these types of land land based programs in their own community and um for myself like just traveling to other communities further south further east and seeing just how incredibly lucky we are in the north there are places on our land that are so pristine they're so close to when our ancestors walked on it um, and um, for this work right now, like conserving these areas, creating protected areas, that's incredibly important for us and our and our and our children, but also for everybody in the whole world. Um, the the amount of water, like our clean air, we were listened about like carbon things, and. Um, but um, yeah, so the further the further south and the further east I've been to indigenous communities, uh, that gap of knowledge is generations long from the last person that did these land-based art practices in their community. And so for myself, it took me um, like four years and I traveled to five different communities and I worked with numerous of elders for myself just to gain that knowledge. Um, and 
it, and that that was lost maybe like one generation of my family so it's um so like the lessons that I've learned is just like the, the just the impacts of colonialism like across all indigenous communities is uh, there's just incredible varying varying degrees and also I was um, just very fortunate to to be Dene and and be from from Dene and Day. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was uh, telling a story about the elder, and I said, um, "What makes you strong? What what makes your mind, your heart, and your body strong?" In the Tling Chung, um, he said, "Well, I was on the I'm on the land. I do things out on the land, and so." Just realized, I mean, not realizing, but she's talking about uh, how to do the caribou tan. That's her, her, uh, like a pa passage that we go through. When she found that she could do that work, she felt completely whole as a Denny person. I can understand what you're talking about. For me, it's through caribou. Uh, me was through, through caribou because my grandpa took me out on the land and we went caribou hunting all the time. But then, when I went out hunting, he picked up the knife and said, here, it's your turn. That's when I know that I'm being tested to see if I'm gonna graduate. <laughs> I took the knife and I just walked, I knew how to do it. I just did what I had to do and the same thing I was taught over and over and I just did it. And the elder went here and shook my hand and said, well done. That's when I felt that I was complete. That's what we're looking for. That's what our young people are looking for. Each one of us, there's a gift that we have that we achieve something, now we want to give it to people. It's, that's what our young people are looking for. In each one of you, have something in you that you yourself have a strength between the two worlds that we're living in. But that's, where we're, that's what we're trying to ask and that's what we're trying to pass on to the next generation, to let them know what their strength, what kind of cultural and what activities they're strong in so we could help them to go out on the land. I just want to share that. Masi. Masi. Did you were going to add something, Frank? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, sometimes you can, in our communities, you can count on one hand who's doing all the work. And it's those people that are committed to the process. And uh, I think it just takes a lot of resolve to the question, you know, about uh, what words of encouragement, I mean, really... Uh, being able to just uh, have grit, be gritty, and, you know, we come from a canoe culture, and, um, like, the insights that I learned connecting to the natural rhythms of the ocean and um, the incredible intelligence and wisdom and knowledge and strength and skill and talent that was uh, embedded in our ancestral ways and um, for a long time, we've had a lot of negative stuff projected onto us as Native people. And when you go and you practice and you begin to really unpack it and understand, it's like, wow, this is actually pretty amazing what um, our ancestors knew to um, prosper and uh, on, on our lands and our waters. And so... I think it's kind of going back to that and that when you get that insight and because we're really only a shadow of what our ancestors were and uh, that's where we can gather our strength from when we really understand and that's a part of that imparting that uh, thinking and that understanding like one of the panelists here talked about we normalize the the, the load, the burden of the work. This is what we do. You know, um, I remember one time being out fishing and uh, there was this kid from the city that came out and 
he started screaming around, Ah! Ah! And everybody stopped working and they ran over to him and said, What's the matter? My hands are cold! Because <laughs> his tolerance wasn't there because he wasn't accustomed to it. And, and life is challenging. And that's a part of the work that we're doing is um, strengthening our young people to be able to carry the load and have the resolve to, to deal with the challenges that we all face in life. Every one of us as human beings, you know, we struggle and so it's that resiliency and the coping aspects of our lives. And that's the powerful lessons that come from the land. And it's real practical. It's real simple. Our people knew what they needed to do. And they weren't talking about a lot of stuff and been really technical. And that's incredible. Because when you can, that's sophistication when you can break it down into its essential elements. And that's what our, our ancestors did. So that's the message in response to the question that I have. I see. We're out of time. Do you can skip some quick closing remarks then? <laughs> I just wanted to say quickly that um, the, I think the biggest learning that I have is putting faith in the process and relationships and you know, we say that we let the land lead learning, but that's not just for the kids, and that's not just for when we're actually out there. That's for us, too. And it's for how we run bush kids, but it's also for how we live our lives and how we get on the land all the time. And the magic that comes from letting go and allowing the land and the people involved to take the day and the learning where it needs to go, um, that's completely changed how I do everything. And I think it's a fundamentally indigenous value that we put that trust in our lands and relationships and don't always have to be so tightly scheduled. And um, I was just uh, chatting with Robin before and saying, you know, like when, I, when we're looking for, for partners and funding, the first thing we have to say is build, build in that flexibility to follow our relationships and land. And if we can't have it, then I don't want your money because it's really, really, really important. That's all I'll say. Do you want to say anything, Kelsey? Well, if you still have a question, you can ask them tomorrow on the breaks. Some of them will be here, maybe not all of them. And please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. Thank you so much.